Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons, and today you're going to get to listen in on a conversation I had with Leonard Sweet. And I don't know if you've ever read a Leonard Sweet book, but this is somebody who has been faithfully for decades now looking at the future, trying to understand what's got up to, but what are the cultural issues the church is going to have to deal with? And if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know we care a lot about that. I mean, this is part of why Q exists, is we want to ask the really big questions about where the world's going. How does faith intersect with that? How can we lead in a cultural moment where there's a lot of confusion and chaos? And Leonard Sweet is somebody who can be a guide for us. Uh, before we get into that interview, though, I want to invite you to, to come and join with us in person, because part of what we'll talk about today with Leonard Sweet is artificial intelligence, of lack of in-person connection, of the value of face-to-face, how it actually overrides most of what we can do through a laptop, through texting one another, through FaceTime, even through social media, that when we come together, there's something unique about being embodied. And that when we're embodied, when we're with one another, there's a transference of information, there's a transference of relationships, there's the beginning of of, of new tangible roots that start to form, that grow things. And so for 14 years now, we've been trying to create that kind of space, and we've done it all over the country. And this year, it will be in Nashville, Tennessee, April 22nd to 24th, and I I know I'm biased, but I don't know that there's another gathering happening that brings together this many leaders who are leading in every area of culture. This isn't just a church leader gathering. About less than a third of the people who come are connected formally to to a church or to a ministry. 70% are business leaders, are people in the education field, the social sector. They're, They're in marketing and sales. They're entrepreneurs. They're people who are sitting in media positions and communicating daily on television or radio or in entertainment. They're filmmakers. They're programmers. They're people who are creating video gaming systems and new media platforms. So it's the kind of people who are innovative. They, they think about the future, but because they're people of faith, they want to think about the future with a lens towards what is God up to? How would he maybe want to use me towards a future that's coming that maybe others around me can't see, but I can see? And because I love and am passionate about the place I've been called, I want to go deeper. I want to learn more. I want to be prepared, and I want to be equipped. So as we're still at the beginning of this new year, I want to challenge you. Make April 22nd to 24th on your calendar something that you want to commit to, something that you're going to gather with another person who wants to come with you. Maybe there's some friends from around the country that you want to come sit with. We do it in tables of eight in a beautiful setting in downtown Nashville, where not only do we pose incredible questions for you to discuss, but you get to hear from these experts. You get to interact with them through our our two different breakout opportunities we create, where it's smaller rooms and you're interacting and engaging with experts on different topics. We're going to cover over 30 topics this year that range from everything from things like criminal justice reform and politics, of course, to better understanding Generation Z and their perspective. That's those who are under 22. How are they thinking about the church? We're going to talk about tough topics such as suicide and the epidemic of rising suicide in our country. We're going to talk about gender identity. We're going to talk about censorship and where's the future of ideas going and are there only certain ideas that are going to make it through for the public to see. So all these conversations completely consequential to the future of faith especially in Western culture. And and to learn more about that, go to qideas.org slash 2020. When you go there, you can see the topics we're talking about. We're adding those daily. You can also see some of our presenters. You can see the experiences that you'll have. We create amazing experiences on our opening night of the event. If you get out in the city with your friends, have great conversations, but also enjoy the good world that God's put around us. Uh, and so we want to see you there April 22nd. Now, As we head into this conversation with Lynn Sweet, I think you're going to see why I'm so excited about the Q Conference is because I care about these issues and Leonard Sweet cares about us as leaders understanding where the future is going, what we should be thoughtful about and concerned about, but also in conclusion, 
why we don't really need to be all that concerned at all because of Christ. And so this Christ-centric conversation is something that I'm excited for you to start your new year off with. So let's listen and know. Well, Lynn, it is great to have you on the Q podcast. This is the first time ever. And so it's just fun for our audience to get to hear from you. And as I've told them about you, you are somebody who's just been a prophet, somebody who thinks about the future, who predicts some things. And and now with this track record of, of over the last 20 years, I mean, back in 99, when you wrote Soul Tsunami, you were doing the same thing. And it's just it's amazing that it's been 20 years, but that you're still doing the same thing for leaders, for the church to think through where the world's going and how we ought to engage it, especially as the church. And so thank you for that. Thank you for, thank you for your faithfulness over the many years. Well, I'm glad to uh, appreciate you recognizing that and um, appreciate that. I, I, I have actually a, a whole set of doctoral students that I work with. I'm in my 18th year, Gabe, with um, students just working in something called semiotics. And that's really what I do in this, in Rings of Fire and what I did in, in, um, you know, soul tsunami. Before that, actually, in '94, I did faith quake. So, hmm. th- this attempt to really help people to read the signs and then know what to do about it. So, yeah. So, I've, I'm raising up a whole tribe of Issacharians. So, <laughs> well, we love. Well, we we love that. I mean, one of the practices we talk about that has just been a part of the church and has to be a part of the church is embracing the context that we're in. So we we understand it, but then we understand God's called us into this moment. So we got to bring our best. We need to be smart. We need to be informed. And I feel like that's what you're doing. And your new book, Rings of Fire, has just been such a good read for me to start to get my thinking there, because these are the things, I mean, I love reading about the future. I love thinking about it. God's given me a passion towards that. And so when I read your words and the way you're thinking about it, um, there's resonance. It challenges me on areas I haven't delved into enough. Uh, and so today, I just want our audience to get to hear just big picture more about you, since they maybe haven't read Soul Tsunami. They don't, they don't even know who Dr. Leonard Sweet is, and I want them to just hear a little more about you. So let's let's go back to just a little bit of your story here, and then we'll jump into the hot topics of our moment. We'll look ahead over the next 20 years and some of the predictions you're making and the ways we should think about it. But help people get acquainted with, I mean, back in 94 when you wrote that that book, uh, and you've written 25 books, so you've written a lot of books, but take us back to just a moment when there wasn't a lot of people talking about the kind of things you were talking about then. You know, there, there was a comfort in the church. There was a sense that, hey, everything's comfortable in American life. Things are fine. And yet you were kind of disruptive and, you know, that had its, I'm sure, advantages, but some disadvantages to people not understanding who you were and what you were trying, were you trying to destroy the church or deconstruct the church? But in, in a sense, you were so passionately concerned about the church that you were willing to say some things that people weren't willing to say. So take me back to, to those years for you. And well, just, I'll give you one little, one little image, um, because you're exactly right. I, you know, I love the church and that's why I care about it so much. And, uh, so I was raising up kind of this cry in the wilderness that things are going to change and it's going to, it's coming quick and all this kind of stuff. And, and one bishop, uh, I'm, I'm from the tribe called United Methodist and one bishop had me in to work with his cabinet and, and some other leaders. And, and on a break, when we came back after the break in the morning, he went up and he said, this is who I've decided, finally decided what sweet is. And so he goes up on the board and he draws this bug and then um, puts all these, like, what I thought were wires at the time. And then he, I sat there, I'm looking at this, he goes, doesn't anybody get it? That's a hairy tick. And so he drew this, <laughs> this, this tick with, with hair all sticking out, like it was frazzled. And, and so um, I, I've kind of been, that's the, um, the hairy tick. Uh, and all, all I was doing was just calling the church to, these are the, the you cannot, you know, get comfortable. There's a whole change coming, and it's going to upend yeah. everything. And and but, well, yeah. Well, one of the one of the things you you write in this book, especially when we're talking about artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and robotics and some of the future that we know is upon us, but that most people would rather turn their head and not think about it. They'd rather just say this isn't going to happen, or if it happens, I'll figure it out as it comes. And they almost don't have the stomach to look it in the face and go, this is my new reality. This is our family's new reality, our children, the people we're called to minister and disciple to, our community's new reality. And what what is it about us as human beings that we just want to look away from these things? Yeah, I, I 
I don't know. I mean, that's that's a really good. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Yeah, just fear of the unknown, I guess. Right? Just yes, yeah. It, and, but it's uh, part of our mandate is to um, be present to the times that we're in. I mean, again, to serve this present age, our calling to fulfill. That's a Charles Wesley song, and and so part of the challenge for me has always been: what does it mean to serve? this present age, my calling to fulfill. It's not an age I would have picked. It's not an age that I even like, but this is the age that God gave me. And for us to think that one day we're going to be able to meet our maker and say, you know, I didn't really like that age you gave me. So I, I did really effective ministry for the 1970s. And I was so good for the 1970s. Yeah. But this is the 21st century. You got 22nd century kids. Yeah. But I really didn't like that moment you gave me. Yeah. I don't think that's going to work for us. Right. And, and I mean, part of what's so wild about this particular moment, and you said, you know, sometimes you dislike this age, but there's the chaos of it, right? There's, there's so much happening at this moment that we know about, and maybe in previous centuries, there was a lot happening and we just didn't know about it. But, but now because of our ability to stay informed, to read about it, to understand, to see the news, to, to be aware of way more information than maybe mentally we were, we were really capable of knowing how to synthesize or process, I think it can leave people just feeling paralyzed. And what you do is you lead us through it and you go, look, we don't need to be paralyzed by this. Let's just take a, take a moment here. Let's let, you know, read my book, Rings of Fire. Let's, let's walk through what it's going to look like to advance into this new age. And, And maybe you could just help us understand when you look at the context, you know, the whole first part of your book gets into some of the big hot zones, you call them. Can you just describe for us, uh, for you, what are, what are, what are the ways we should be thinking about the hot zones, the especially in American life, since a lot of our listeners will be American that are listening to this? What what are you seeing as as we look at the next decade or two? What we're needing to be aware of that's just unique about this moment, maybe compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago? Well, there, there's so many. What, what you already mentioned it, Gabe, and that is that change itself has changed. And this is something that I, I started talking about back in, in Faithquakes 94, that that change is no longer incremental, it's, it's exponential. So every, that's why everything's happening so fast, that's why everything's happening so quick. That, um, and that, that can be a little dizzying for people, and I, I think we ought to understand that, but we also have Jesus, so you know, we, you have, we have Jesus, so we can do this. But um, I, think, I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that, that we've got to come up with right now is that, um, this is, a, this is a culture that is profoundly not just post-Christian, but anti-Christian, and it's becoming more so. And that does not mean, and I, I spent a whole lot of time in this book, as you know, talking about the problem with secularization theory. And yeah. this is a culture that is not secular. This is a culture that is wrapped and warped and riven in, in spirituality. It is a deeply spiritual culture. So it's just not a Christian culture. And so I talk about sacralization, not secularization. Mm -hmm. And and we become out there in this culture, we become polytheistic. There are many, many gods. We become plural theistic. That's one vast synthesis of all the religions in this pantheon of gods. And, and so the, the whole secularization theory that, that academics have loved to talk about for the last 30, 40 years, I call an academic hoax. It is not the reality in which we live. We live in a deeply, this culture turns everything it touches into an idol. Yeah. Uh, and and everything is sacred for it. I mean, sports, we're coming up on the Super Bowl. I mean, this is a sacred ritual for crying out loud. For, right. for the, for, so let, let's get rid, let's get some categorical um, clarity here that we do not live in a secular culture. It's a deeply sacral, sacred culture, but where, which is profoundly hostile to Christianity. Yeah. And to say that this culture is anti-Christian, I mean, that's a, there's a season where if you were to say that 30 years ago, you were seen as an alarmist, you were seen as, you know, a right winger, you were seen as somebody who was, was saying this, the sky is falling. But now Leonard Sweet is saying we're in an anti-Christian culture. And and the dynamics of being in an anti-Christian versus a friendly to Christian culture are very different, very different in how we engage with our neighbors, what we understand about the way our neighbors perceive us. I know some of the, the research that David Kinnaman and I did for our book, Good Faith, laid out, you know, 46% of Americans think religion is part of the problem. 
Now, of course, their definition of religion was was a little different than what we're talking about. They don't they don't sometimes see the religions they're living by because they don't call them religions. They they see themselves as non religious. But to your point, you know, I was looking at the the Twitter data that they've compiled over the last three and a half years, where they look at the hashtags, the conversations, and when they remove politics and they remove sports from the conversations, the the one of the top trends is DIY spirituality that people are talking about. Do it yourself spirituality, which is what you're saying. You pull from what you want, take the little piece here and there, create your own version of God and then go out and live that and feel good about yourself. That's yeah, so, all my truth. My truth. My truth. Y- yes, that's right. And and you'd mentioned that in this book, you know, the idea of this individual truth, you know, is kind of the new way of of approaching truth. And so, uh, you know, as you as you think about the hot zones, one one of the things I want you to comment more on though is you talk about the disunited states of America. You have a whole chapter on this idea of how we're seeing America start to come apart and we're losing union, we're losing that sense of one people for one time. Uh, talk about the effects that could have over the next decade and and how the church uniquely could play a role in being some healing balm for what's taking place. Well, it, that, that was the hardest chapter gave for me to write. Be- and I and many times writing that chapter, and it was a lot longer. I actually thought at one point of making it into a book, but um, I, I just, I don't want to I don't want to go down that way. You know, I just, cause it's so painful to talk about it, but our kids are not going to live in the same United States of America that we did. I mean, this, we are seeing some things happen and partly, let, let me just say, partly it's part of the whole mediated living that we our mediated lives. Um, I mean, you, you cannot take a walk through the world without viewing that walk through the lens of mediation. Everything we do is focused on social media. I mean, you, I, when I grew up and you probably too, um, our parents taught there was appropriate dress for a certain occasion. So you, when you went to grandma's, you dress for grandma. When you went to church, you dress for the church. Uh, that's all gone. Kids dress for how they're going to look on Instagram when they take a selfie of the picture of them there. It, it, the new default setting, the new co- context default is not the context itself, it's the world of, of media. So the mediated, uh, and Thomas, uh, they, what, what's the guy's name? They, they Zogatia or whatever, he wrote a book called Mediated that I really, it was very influential to me. I can't remember his last name, but he, he, he talked about this, this mediation and this, this new mindfulness of mediation, I think is how he put it. So that's one thing. But the second thing is, in this world of social media, there's a, a new monetization that, again, when I, when I started out, you, you subscribed to a journal. You, you paid money to get the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or, or the Economist or, or um, you, you paid for a subscription. Now that's gone. What enables all these uh, sites, these mediated sites to, to exist is advertising and advertising is based on clicks and engagement. And that's what fuels and funds uh, media. So you got, they've got to keep people clicking. They've got to keep people engaged so that they've got the advertising revenue that they need. Well, how do you keep people engaged? Well, one is clickbait, deception. And the other is, and I hate to say this, but it's deception and enragement. You en- you enrage to engage. So all these sites keep you enraged because that keeps you engaged, and that keeps you that keeps their revenue stream going. So we've got media itself enraging us, and part of that enragement is separating us from each other, uh, deep fake world, uh, alternative facts, troll farms. Y'all know what I'm talking. Yeah, and that is ripping this social fabric and fiber apart. Yeah, and and if if we as church leaders, those who are responsible for discipling those within our care, are not aware of that reality that our context has changed so dramatically that how we relate to one another is different, uh, and and I, I guess the question that it seems hard for people to to really land on, and I'm curious if you've landed on this, but but. You know, you look at technology sometimes, and and I don't know your opinion on every technology, but but the sense that technology is neutral can be an assumption that a lot of people have, versus technologies having bias towards certain behavior and biases towards, um, you know, negative uh, 
a negative approach to something or a positive approach. For example, a gun is biased towards violence, right? So, so maybe you're using it to hunt, um, not necessarily kill somebody, but, but that's a bias that it has. It's not a neutral bias. Um, when you look at the future of how technologies are developing, such as social media, such as us getting more comfortable with the phone being in our hand and somewhat attached to us and uh, looked at as a direct tool that we must utilize to communicate now to much broader uh, groups of people than beyond just our local community or those who know us. Are you seeing that this starting to to take shape and you would say, hey, some, some of this media is biased towards a post-human era that we need to be hyper aware of and the church ought to be shouting from the rooftops, be careful, tread carefully, Let's let's pull back here for a second. Let's recognize how this technology is reshaping our imagination, how we're thinking, how we're talking to one another. Uh, or would you just say, "Hey, this is just part of how progress ad- advances. It's scary at, at the beginning, but we need to embrace it and utilize it, in, you know, instrumentally for our own purposes." No, well, you know, I think, of course, I, I'm going to. Uh, I'm an incarnationalist, so I want to incarnate the gospel in whatever that culture is, but. Jesus said, you're in the world, in that culture, but don't be of it. And so I, I think you're exactly right. Every culture, every technology has a certain bias. and But it's not just the church's job. It's the parent's job. It's the job of the home, the family, the church, the community to say to these kids, um, I mean, I was a bookworm, and my parents were constantly worried about me being a bookworm, what that was going to do to me, because that technology just fed and fueled my own uh introversion, you know, and, and so th- there were remedies, there were implications of what it meant for me to do this way. So th- the, the phrase I use is parents, we need for our kids, we need to not to isolate them, but to insulate them. And part of that insulation is missing. The church is not being insulating its, its, its people. The families are not insulating its people. It, it is a, we are in a dangerous situation. We just send our kids into this world. I, I, I grew up with a, a mentality of there were certain words you didn't say because they had power to take you over. There were bad words. Don't say those words because they can take you yeah. over. Well, you think words are bad. Images are even worse. Images can take you over in a minute. And so we have an ethic of words. We have no ethic of images. If there are certain words you should never say, maybe there's some images you should never see. And if you do, you need repentance and you need cleansing rituals. My grandma, I'm from West Virginia, she had a cleansing ritual when I had bad words. And and uh, <laughs> did it involve soap in your mouth? <laughs> that's exactly. So this is what we're talking about. I think you're exactly right. We've got. But that's up to the church to do that. It's up to the family to do that. And we are not even asking those questions, Gabe. Yeah, well, I think there's this tension in the church, and I I see it illustrated at some of the highest intellectual levels of of Christianity, evangelicalism, where, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Rod Dreher, wrote a book called The Benedict Option a few years ago that, you know, really, really struck out a bit of a vision that, that looked as if the church and Christians and that he was advocating should pull back from some of these cultural spaces that we're inhabiting and actually get our own families in order, get our own churches in order, connect more, network better as institutions, because we're being taken over by a wave of of both, as he would describe, secularism, but also of of new forms of culture that we're we're undoubtedly completely unprepared for. And to just blindly continue to say, we're just gonna be in the world and not of it, and yet not actually have the 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 core community around you on the same page theologically or philosophically about how to engage this, that we will be so weak, we'll just be completely overrun. And and I know he gets lambasted for having that perspective, but as I hear you talk, and I know in my own thinking, there's value to thinking that way. There's value into saying, hey, if we're in the long game here, there's moments where with your kids, with your family, with your church, uh, that there's, there's something to be said about putting some guardrails up and saying, we're, we need to be wise. We need to go deeper with those who are within our care and shepherding them and preparing them for this world. And sometimes that might seem a little uh, as if we're, we're backing off of our mission to go into the world, but how, how are you seeing that? Well, I, that's, that's where I, I feel exactly like you do about that book, and in some ways the way, the way you presented it, because I think he diagnoses our problem and our challenge, but the game is not the huddle. I mean, you do need to huddle. And families need to huddle. The church needs to huddle. We all need to huddle. But the game is not the huddle. You come out of the huddle and down the field. 
and that's where, again, you huddle to insulate, to prepare, to strategize, to warn. This is what this is what the lay of the land is. But God did not call his church to huddle. We are yeah. there to huddle only long enough to come out of that huddle and go down the field in ministry and mission. So I, I want I fall between the cracks. I want huddle time, but I want mission time. I want field time down the yeah. field. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, I get the, the people that want to stay all life in the huddle, don't like the mission part. The people who like the mission part don't like the huddle part. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a beautiful blend of the two that's just going to be necessary. And I think the younger we go with our children, maybe it's a little more huddle um, as we're preparing them for launch. And I think parents are struggling with that today. They're their their children. I, I have three teenagers. The access to the information. It's hard to insulate in this world. I mean, the only way to insulate is is definitely not to have a phone don't have internet in your home, you know, I mean, there's, there's some real extreme measures you could take, but then you're not necessarily preparing them for how are they going to live within that space. But let's, let's move on. I think, I think artificial intelligence, uh, you know, you, you talk about it so well in here, genetic engineering, we've got, uh, information technology, nano robotics, you know, these are some of the things we've talked about at Q over the last several years, actually a decade ago. I don't know if you know Shane Hips, but he, he gave a talk in 2009 at our Q event we had in Austin uh, on, this, on, on the cell phone and, and how it was starting to reshape our minds, rewire us, uh, make us less present, less embodied as human beings, how this was a problem and the church needed to be paying attention to it. Well, you fast forward to this past year, we had Andy Crouch uh, give a talk on the theology of cyborgs. And the idea being, what, what does it look like when you're asked to put a chip into your head or you're asked to get the chip in your wrist when you go to work to kind of track some things because it's more convenient? And, and we're trying to stay ahead of those conversations and help the church understand where this is going so that, so that we don't just half-heartedly follow along with innovation and technology and look at every new innovation and every new tech that's introduced and go, oh, this is good for the world. This is innovation versus having a bit of a view towards this where we're assessing, what is this going to do to our community? What is this going to do to my own humanity? How, how am I giving up part of who I am? And, and you delve into that in this, in this book, very specifically, some of these areas that it, it seems many Christians aren't thinking about, don't want to talk about, don't know enough about it to feel like they can engage it with intelligence. And yet it seems to me this is the front line. Like This is one of the most urgent areas that we need to be concerned with as it relates to how are we being human and, and what do we have to offer to the world uh, as people who are made in the image of God and are struggling with the question of what does it mean to be human because of how much tech is starting to intercept our lives. Uh, and are you seeing it that same way? Are, are you seeing this as one of those new frontiers that we just need to be smarter on and start teaching about and helping people understand, even if they start to roll their eyes? Yeah, well, I, I've been singing this song for 20 years, um, and uh, Bill Joy, who was one of the co-founders of, of uh, Java, when he really invented that whole program, and, and with Tim Berners-Lee, he's the real one that helped to establish the internet. He, in 1999, as we went over remember that Y2 thing, um, he wrote an article, Why the Future Doesn't Really Need Us, and put it in Wired magazine. And that was required reading for all my students for a couple of years. But he's arguing, he's no interest now in theology or religion or whatever, but he's, ar he's arguing that in these areas that I, I kind of acronym in the, in the book GRAIN, genetic engineering, robotics, artificial intelligence, information technology, and nanotechnology, we are going so far, the scientists, the science is going so far beyond any moral or ethical comprehension or even philosophical and metaphysical understanding. These, this is his phrasings that he argued that scientists ought to declare a moratorium for a few years on cutting edge research in all those areas until they could convince the, the philosophical and ethical and religious community to engage them in conversation because they were in a, a new land, a new territory that there, he knew there would be, there'd be dragons there, but they didn't know where the dragons were. And they really needed some, some conversation with, ethicists and theologians and philosophers to, to come to terms with the cutting edges of these areas. And now this is 1999, Gabe. And, um, you know, I, I've been 
flailing that article. I, I've had lectures that I start doing this and everybody's eyes, you're exactly right. They start glazing over. <laughs> you know, I right. go, we're all cyborgs now. We've already crossed that. That The question is, how cyborgian do you want to get? And people look at you like, <laughs> what are you? you know? So I say, my mother, when she died, she was a cyborg. She had artific- She had a pacemaker, uh, artificial hip. She was part born, part made. How far do we go on this? And everybody's eyes glaze over. So, yeah, yeah. But you're, uh, the big one is AI. Let me just say, AI will be to humanity what the invention of fire was, if not bigger. It will have that kind of impact on what it means to be human. And we have we are just at the beginning stages of AI. And if we don't start talking about artificial intelligence and what that means and its implication for our understanding of what it means to be human, I have a book coming out called A Jesus Human, where I just try and deal with this whole issue. What is Jesus didn't Jesus is the last Adam. He died on the cross. Not to make us into Christian. I, I, the, I wanted to title the book, maybe, Will There Be Any Christians in Heaven? Jesus did not die to found a new religion called Christianity. Christianity is what we did to Jesus. Jesus is the last Adam who, who showed us how to be the original human that God created us to be. The original Adam. And it's all about, the future has got to be all about humanity. Yeah. Now, I believe that the way to be human is, is through Jesus. So I'm a yeah. Jesus yeah. human. Yeah, but right. you've got to bring the particular and the universal together, and nobody wants to do either. They don't want to talk about the particularity of Christ, and they don't want to talk about the universality of what it means to be human. And that's exactly what the future needs. Well, and I think those questions are just going to come up more and more. The exciting thing about a future with a lot of chaos and a lot of unanswered questions is people start talking again. They start asking questions and there's an opportunity for us to give better answers than maybe they're hearing from social media or from their friends or from their latest professor about what it really means to be human. Where do we find the the deepest uh, meaning and purpose in life? Some of those just existential questions every human being's asked, but they don't always have the best answers. And that's been a key for Christianity as we look back over the centuries, is that the Christian faith did offer answers to some of these existential questions that were way better than what the rest of of the religious world could offer or anybody else could offer, because it actually made sense. It was coherent. Uh, It aligned with reality the most. Uh, And so I I think I'm so thankful that you're spending time working on this and thinking through it. I know sometimes it can feel lonely because you're, you're, you're decades ahead of where other people are of their concerns, and then it's 20 years later when they finally appreciate your work and go, man, you were really on it. And so I wa- what I want to say to our, our listeners is Leonard Sweet is somebody that you need to read now. This isn't one of those where let's wait 20 years to see how many of these predictions come true, how many of the questions that he's suggesting we will be asked as Christians that we need to prepare for. Absolutely, we need to be preparing for it. We need to be not only preparing ourselves, but preparing those who God's put in our care. And that could be your children. It could be your just friend group. It could be uh, people within your local community, your workplace, your church. Um, If we're not having conversations about the future and, and where we see the world going, uh, and how we can best intersect that, then I don't know that we're being faithful stewards of the moment. And you've been an incredible steward of that. So, Lynn, in closing, will you just, as, as you look at the next decade, and 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 when we're talking to pastors, let's say it's it's church leaders listening right now, which is a portion of our audience, but I want you to focus in on on the church leaders who Sunday week in week out they're teaching a sermon they're they're trying to encourage their people they're exhorting them they're bringing them back to the word of god and helping them uh better understand you know what jesus's life was about and what he called us to do and they're tr- they're trying to teach around that as you look a, a decade from now i mean where do you think our pastors need to be in terms of education on some of these issues in terms of how much these types of topics should be coming up in any type of gathering that's gathering God's people together, uh, where we're talking about some of these subjects that I think for pastors sometimes feels off limits, doesn't feel like it's something that should be talked about in church. Is your feeling that this is going to need to become a more important part of the conversation? Well, I do think it's an important part of the conversation, but I do think that the most important thing we can do is lift up Christ. And and that is not being done, in my mind, uh, nearly enough. You get you. We got sermons out there on how to on every kind of it's their appy sermons. How to have a here's the application. Here's how to you know have a better marriage. Here's how to have a better life. Here's how to make more money. So we're we're full of all sorts of 
of uh, motivational stuff. But the unique calling of a preacher is to lift up Christ. And in fact, if he be lifted up, he says, I will draw all people to me. Christ is, Christ is the draw. And I, I just, I'm just trying to get, if we just lift him up, he has the, he has, he has the power to change lives. Our, our preaching no longer has the power to change lives, much less convert thieves on crosses or thieves hiding out in trees like Zacchaeus or thieves presiding at sumptuous tables like, uh, like uh, Levi, the public. I mean, you've got, we, we, all we have to do is to lift up Christ and he will draw. And so that, that's my passion is that he's the one that can, we can navigate uh, and negotiate anything if we are following him and he's in the lead and uh, we're behind him and just lift him up. And I, and I have found, I mean, when, when you're in scripture, when you're, when you're in communion with God and the Holy Spirit's giving you discernment and wisdom, that as these new topics and information come at you, that maybe you're not that educated on, uh, as an expert might be, but but you you do have a sense towards and a discernment towards: is this good or bad? Is this is this here to harm me? Is this taking away from how God's designed me to operate in in my fullest um, ability uh, as as a person made in the image of God, or is this actually distorting that? Is this taking me out of it? And when you when you kind of have that operating system right, you can start to take all these issues in, and and that's what you do so well in Rings of Fire. As you can tell, you have an incredible foundational operating system and worldview that allows you to take in all of the new conversations, questions, information, and and you know as you know scores more that we haven't even thought of yet that are going to be coming at the next generation. And with that rootedness in Christ, you can actually see through it, and you can help guide others. Uh, to have peace and purpose, even in the midst of where a world's getting a lot more anxious about some of these new things and not certainty about where things are going. So I just want to thank you again for your faithfulness on this. Thanks for this book and uh, the resource I know it is to me and that it'll be to so many who read it and uh, look forward to seeing you in the near future. Yeah, appreciate that, Gabe. Look forward to seeing you. It's true. I could have talked to Lynn Sweet all day. I love the way that he's faithfully done this. If you don't know, he lives on a place called Orcas Island and truly is just discipling people and has been a faithful leader in that way through not only his books, but in person. But I want to encourage you to to read his book. It's been very impactful for me, and I want it to be something that's just a resource for you as you try to lead right where you're at and to better understand these issues. The book is called Rings of Fire, and the subtitle, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. And I know it sounds dramatic, but it's it's dramatic. He talks about genders and gendering. He has this term called sexularism, which is hard to say, but it actually gets at the roots of the type of culture we have. He talks about diversity and unity, race relations. He talks about the planet and earth and uh, global warming, artificial intelligence. Uh, he has all kinds of new terms you've never heard of, but we need to be aware of. And I think more than anything, it's one of those books that just gets your mind spinning towards this future and helps you uh, with compassion. Try to think ahead for your kids and your grandkids. What is the world they're growing up in? And how, if we have any opportunity to steward right now, our opportunity to prepare them for that future, how do we do that? And this is the type of resource that will help you do it. So I hope you'll enjoy this. Share this podcast with your friends. Leave us a review. Let people know that you enjoy Q on a weekly basis, getting to hear these interviews, also getting to hear our talks, because it's through you spreading the word that these conversations become more of a reality for Christian communities, for small groups, for your friends, and don't we need more conversations like this happening? So join us anytime at qideas.org, where you can get access to our video clips of one- and two-minute clips of some of our best moments at Q. You can also subscribe to get our full-length talks that include questions and the ability for you to convene conversations in your home through Q Media. So check it out. We're glad you listened in on this conversation and excited to continue this in the weeks ahead.